Harris. Um, Ian was speaking a little while about his experiences using the profiler and um, how we've been working with them. PPM that is working with EC Harris on, on a project to show how the profiler can be used within the EC Harris organization. And judging by what I've seen from Ian's presentation, he's got a number of uh, he's got a number of things to share what, with us and his experiences on it and, and how he felt the software really integrated within his practice. So that will be a little bit later. The order of the day for the moment, what I'd like to do is maybe take two or three minutes um, to basically give you a quick overview of where the profiler sits um, in the, the whole BIM scheme of things. Um, and then I'm quickly going to pass it over to Ian as well for him to give a good overview of, of the case study that we've been working on at the moment. So just a quick bit of housekeeping as well. Um, you see most of you should all have a, a right pane um, with GoToWebinar. So within there you can see a chat window um, within the whole system. Please, please feel free to enter any questions that you have within that window. Um, I'm more than happy. I'll be monitoring them when I finish talking about the, the initial parts of the profiler, and uh, you know, I'll keep questions towards the very end. And uh, you know, please feel free to put anything in there, and we'll discuss them a little bit later on a Q&A session at the end of about 15 minutes. I hope to go talking for about 45 minutes all told, and then about 15 minutes of Q&A session. I hope to get a, a good bit of conversation going. So. Just to quickly jump in to the presentation itself, and where does the profiler sit in the whole BIM scheme of things? As you can see there, it's very much a project feasibility and analysis tool. Predominantly, it's a conceptual cost estimating tool to allow you to make quick and easy assumptions um, based on logical data. So essentially what you do is you create the external form, and you can apply costs to that external form, be the cladding and that. And then you can also input that then with the internal spaces and you, you can actually do a room by room takeoff to allow you to create simple conceptual cost estimates that are very detailed and, and allow you to very much um, start to uh, develop costings and a logical budget at that early stage. So as you can see there, I mean it fits in with all of the design tools that you have further down the line, like likes of Revit, Navisworks, so on. Um, so that's certainly certainly where it fits in. It's a quick um, view of, of the concept behind the profiler. So again, as I was saying, a simple 3D computer model. You define the external geometry. You also define some of the site features, as you can see there, site car parking, some landscape area, and so on. That can all be intuitively linked to the quantity that you have calculated in your cost estimate. And as I'm sure he will demonstrate in his presentation, you have a situation where the costs come to life and you can actually see what parts, what components of the model um, are associated with what cost. Um, so moving on then, you, you tie the cost, uh, sorry, tie the data to the cost, you tie the computer 3D model to the actual costing information and also you apply it in the 4D sequencing and scheduling aspect of it so you can run through an animation of the construction costs as, uh, as you see it. Um, also, some of the other features, I mean, this, this is a what-if analysis tool, so it allows you to actually see other areas of the uh, of the construction project to make more assumptions uh, on what is the best solution for you to build, what is the optimal solution for you to build. So you can bring in scope, you can bring in design criteria as well, you can write in your assumptions of what you have put into your cost estimate. Um, energy analysis is also one of the tools that's within the profiler. So you can use regionalized weather data um, to actually make assumptions on the energy usage in your building and then apply the costs to that particular uh, part of the building. Cut and fill analysis is also there. You have the ability to import topographical information through Google Earth or through your own DWG DXF information. You are then able to place the building and other site components on any part of the site. Um, obviously you have the topo information. And what you can do with that then is change the elevation of the building, put the elevation on the side, um, and you are able to uh, you are able to see your analysis. Um, so basically, that's a quick overview of, of what the product is, what is what it's capable of doing. Um, so I'm now going to hand it over to Ian to be the presenter of it.
um, and I'd like to invite Ian now, just made a presenter there. Um, so it's over to you, Ian. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. I hope you have a fantastic, uh, fantastic um, Tuesdays. Um, just starting off, um, a bit of an overview, if you like, a bit of background as to uh, our involvement with uh, Deep Profile and PPM. We um, became aware of it a couple of years ago uh, through discussions with um, American company Vet Technology, and we're very keen to try and understand how the software could be used to uh, improve deliverables from a, a cost management perspective, especially early on in projects. Um, what we saw was very impressive, and um, we were keen to try and explore that a bit further. Through ongoing discussions, we uh, arranged a, um, a trial with uh, a live scheme that we're working on. The scheme is um, for the University of Manchester, and it's a central teaching building. Um, it's a feasibility, and we felt that that um, dovetailed in quite nicely for us to try and show its uh, potential on a large scheme, and um, also to um, be able to show the client some outputs that we can achieve um, on that. So the basis of uh, this presentation is really giving an overview as to what we went through, um, a bit of insight as to how we found the software and the deliverables the software produced, um, and hopefully a, a, a bit of um, guidance, if you like, in terms of um, some of the things we felt it could do and uh, how far you can take it. Uh, just a brief introduction myself. My name is Ian Alderson, associate with E.C. Harris, um, been heavily involved with um, in and uh, all things sort of technology-based with construction over the last uh, four or five years. I'm a member of BIM 2050 group, uh, which is uh, a group in the CIC, which is promoting um, collaboration and um, the right sort of cultures to enable us to um, fulfill the potential that uh, BIM and emerging technologies give. Um, and hopefully, I'm fairly knowledgeable about uh, cost management as well, because that's my technical uh, basis. So uh, without further ado, I'll... Um, <coughs> run through the slides. Um, as I said, the scheme that um, we looked at is a, a live scheme. Um, we were, my company, EC House, were appointed as uh, project manager with a full design team. Um, we appointed the design team over the summer, and in September, we started looking at a feasibility stage and what uh, could be produced. So um, we started this uh, case study slash trial with literally um, some line drawings in terms of what wanted to be achieved from the building. Um, and so the first sketch you'll see up there was our initial kind of thinkings around what it could look like from the ground floor entrance. And we then developed that slightly um, with a couple of options as to how we could fit into lecture theatres, uh, circulation space and general, um, general arrangements. So um, it was a real scheme and uh, as such we had the challenges that you uh, always get feasibility with uh, not actually knowing or having a defined brief um, to go from. Um, <clears throat> we built up... Um, first instance from uh, importing Google Earth information to give the terrain and the right textures and context to um, to the site. This was a, a fantastic input um, because it gave us um, a bit of a steer, if you like, on uh, the type of terrain um, and the levels. Um, whilst you can import full survey data, we didn't have that, but this gave um, the next best thing. And we're also able to sort of uh, use existing uh, soil logs that uh, get information from surrounding sites on to uh, inform our cut and fill analysis, etc. So that was a, that was a good, uh, easy win. Um, as you can see, it's, uh, the import gives you uh, Google Earth images and um, allows you to drop it straight into the profiler to uh, add context to the cost, which is something that I'll uh, probably pick up on as we go through this, but um, it is a key element to, uh, from our experience on the trial to try and bring the cost to life somewhat, because uh, I think spreadsheets can be slightly bland at the best of times, but uh, we've actually been able to engage people around something that um, fitted in and uh, had a bit of relevance to it. Um, we managed to get some really good um, sort of end user uh, engagement. Um, next part, after we've got the um, Google Earth Images um, into the profiler, was to create an external form. As you'll notice, it's a typical QS's building. It's a nice uh, box, not too many features on it. Um, you can do lots of uh, fun tricks with Deep Profiler in terms of cutting away and creating voids and um, having a little bit more interest. Given the stage of the scheme of feasibility, we were keen to um, 
create a box and um, fit the accommodation needed into the box, have all the costs associated with it to prove that um, you, you could build a box um, with all the accommodation required within the uh, budget constraints. <coughs> Obviously, we as uh, cost managers can replicate what others do, but we try not to uh, over-design things in the first instance. So um, that was our starting point. Um, creating the form itself, very easy. Um, it reminded me slightly of Google SketchUp in terms of um, being able to um, plot a uh, polyline, um, extend it up, you can then break that down into the various floor heights. But mm -hmm. um, it's the kind of information that um, I would expect um, at the outset of the scheme if I wanted to cost it. And we were able to put that into a form that uh, gave it, as I said before, a bit of context and uh, relevance to um, to what it was. Um, next part, after we created the basic box, was to um, look at some internal spaces. We had, from the feasibility, a basic list of accommodation, um, which was pretty pretty rough, if you like. Um, gave us some areas and uh, the seat numbers as well, being a higher education um, facility. Uh, we're able to take that um, into Excel, work out some assumed lengths and widths for the spaces, and um, from there we're able to import it into um, the profiler as uh, into the corral, the, um, the term is, which basically gives you 3D images of all the, uh, all the rooms that you specify. Um, this was very easy. Um, again, even for uh, a uh, cost manager to deal with, um, I think the process was literally uh, an hour or so to go from uh, an initial schedule to having uh, 3D uh, models of all the different room types was to then uh, be able to manipulate and deal with. Um, next stage, having developed all the different room types, was to uh, get them into the building. Um, I think one of the uh, fringe benefits from going through the process was um, an appreciation of um, how difficult it is to get all the rooms in the right places and get them to fit. And um, as an aside, I think sometimes um, from a cost perspective, you wonder why buildings are inefficient or they don't quite operate the way they want to. But uh, having gone through the exercise, you do realize that um, architects have got quite a bit on the plate when they're trying to get uh, accommodation to fit into a certain uh, external parameter. Um, so the process of getting the rooms in you were, we were manually importing them, and um, it was able to snap onto corners of uh, the external form, which um, made the whole process relatively easy. Um, and we created what looks like a Rubik's Cube, but um, we had the different types of accommodation color-coded depending on teaching spaces or, um, or kind of ancillary spaces, um, which was, uh, was really helpful, actually, when it came to discussing it with the design team and uh, looking to see um, <clears throat> what we've done and get uh, almost a bit of a rubber stamp that it uh, it made sense not just from a, a kind of QS perspective but also from a, a design perspective to a point. Um, having done that, the next element was uh, we had a, you know, an external form. We've got it fully loaded with uh, different room types. It was to start putting uh, costs into um, into the program. Um, the basic um, you can upload costs as you go if you like room by room, type by type. And uh, going into floor finishes, it's the standard estimators um, breakdown, if you like, the labor, um, plant material, plus um, subcontractor prices, et cetera. So we were able to do that um, relatively uh, easily. Um, we went through it two different, um, two different ways. We managed to um, do it uh, longhand, going through the process uh, on a kind of Windows type basis. And we also uh, later on managed to do it in a bit of a, a, bit of a more sped up way. Uh, for want of a better word. Um, classification system that uh, was in there with the NRM, which was great, that's what so we're using at the moment, but there was also the ability to uh, work with different classification systems, which gave a bit of flexibility, because we still have um, clients that uh, prefer the BCIS um, classifications when you're summarizing the data. Um, so that's a positive as well. Having loaded the uh, various costs in against floors or walls, carpets, etc. The, uh, the software gives you a bit of a step back and sort of shows you the element code and uh, the quantity that you've got there and the cost. Um, to achieve the quantities, you're able to put some, um, use a few parametric calculations and formulas to uh, really pull out from the information that you've got in there um, 
information you need to know. Example um, might be on ceilings, you could put deduction in if you wanted shadow gaps in there and the perimeter, etc. But it gave you the kind of manipulation you'd expect from an Excel sheet, but uh, in a controlled environment, which was a, a real positive. Um, so you're able to build up the various rooms um, with the elemental costs. Um, you're then able to um, copy the cost into other rooms. So doing it, uh, as I sort of refer to, in a long-handed way, you can build up your basic cost into all the items, copy it onto uh, to like rooms so that uh, you've got some efficiencies from there, and um, then start to develop the overall model um, so that you're getting a view of what the, uh, the estimated cost is coming out at. Um, you can see on the screenshot we've got there the, uh, the breakdown that we had and the purposes of doing this was uh, relatively straightforward. We didn't go into uh, too many details, but the ability there to really drill down onto every area. And that's something we're looking at at the moment to try and uh, drill down on uh, items like the base access floor, so you can really go into the, the finite detail of uh, whether the materials fit for the labour. Um, you're able to summarise those items as well, which gives us an interesting steer on the, uh, the cost of labour, which in turn can give you a bit of uh, information around the programming times, etc. Um, so once we've uh, added the different elements in the rooms, we're able to sort of close those rooms off as costed um, and move on to the next ones. Again, quick summary on there, which gives you uh, a view of um, the lecture theatres and how we uh, went about costing those items and uh, the cost that sort of sat against it. You notice that to the rooms themselves, internal elements, uh, that's what the cost sits around. And I'll come on in a second to. Um, how we costed the kind of superstructure, the shell for the rooms that sit within. Um, but you are able to very easily copy and paste, as I've touched on before, the information from one room type into another, saving you putting information in again and again. Um, and once set up, you can then manipulate that and create additional room types with uh, costs already loaded into them, which uh, obviously a huge benefit and um, gives rise to the uh, opportunity to do iterations of costs. Um, represented in a 3D model so that uh, you can quickly advise what could be, what might be, should you change the accommodation type or the accommodation mix. Um, in terms of the general components, the build, as I say, that was picked up separately, got the room types for cost that against them, which is uh, really good. And then we've got the, the external um, kind of superstructure slash shell and core elements of the building, which were picked up um, as separate line items using the footprint and the masses that uh, we produced. Again, all linked back into the model. So if you were to um, adjust it, change the sizes, et cetera, the cost would update as well, which gives you a nice dynamically linked um, cost model. Um, similar again to how we set up uh, Excel cost models, um, but with the other advantage that uh, people can actually see what you've done rather than it being hidden in the depths of uh, an Excel workbook. Um, That sort of gives you a bit of an overview uh, in terms of the uh, general costs. So uh, we've got the 3D model, and in terms of using D-Profile, you're able to fit very quickly between the model and the costs. You're able to highlight rooms, which then highlight on the model, highlight costs that pull out what room they're related to. So there's a lot of um, dynamicism between the two, which is a real benefit when you're uh, trying to explain where things are derived from. Um, so you know, the shell and core, um, general um, building costs are all picked up. Again, you can go into as much detail as uh, you choose to. Um, you're really able to sort of drill right down to sort of level four, level five um, information. Um, first of this, we left it relatively high level um, in order to make it um, slightly more um, workable and functionary. Um, again, you can see the screenshot there. Um, I haven't really picked up on the screen itself. But <coughs> excuse me. Uh, on the right-hand side there, you've got um, the growth building area, which updates itself. And then you've got the uh, rentable building area, which, in case of this, is the net internal area. Um, but it's been quite handy, actually, through developing it to have the dashboard of uh, key information on there, because it pulls out simple information like the um, facade areas 
um, on the facade, you're able to paint in different facade treatments. You're able to go for ribbon windows or solid cladding, which again gives you uh, another level of uh, information that you can share visually, um, but also have um, have that detail sat behind it as well. Um, you're able to manually adjust the um, percentages for things like the glazing um, and how much of that you have, which again was um, was a really real benefit when uh, you're running through these things nice and quickly. And the automated nature of what you're doing so you save a lot of time um, having people check Excel sheets because I'm uh, relatively famous for uh, always having at least one glaring error sat on an Excel sheet that's not pulling through formulas. And um, so whenever we're having it checked off, it's, it's an internal QA uh, procedure that uh, there's a little bit of risk about. Um, with this process, it was uh, it's all sat there and linked in, so there's nothing that you can do to uh, break those links which gives you a bit more surety in terms of uh, the number that you're producing and the validity of the same. Um, next slide we've got was really just about revising um, the model. Um, and uh, it did allow you to do, touched on before, the uh, Excel sheet having to be checked for QA purposes. But uh, this allows you to um, QA the model and ensure the cost related different bits. But you're also able to uh, tweak the model back uh, with the cost still sat inside the room elements and the structure to um, to fit different um, adjacencies, to fit into different uh, requirements spatially, which uh, we found um, a good process to go through. Um, I think uh, often when people change things, it's, it's a full revisit of any uh, cost plan, but this gave a lot more uh, real-time updating, which for a feasibility position is ideal because you're not looking at the pennies, you're looking more at the, uh, the tens of thousands. Um, and as I said, the, uh, the updated model linked back in dynamically to the uh, estimate, so uh, it gave us a back-to-back -back position immediately, uh, rather than us having to sort of take it away and uh, reconfirm to the team uh, what the impact of change has been. Um, so but being through the, uh, the detail of um, how you change that, I think the, as I said before, the, the updating process of its um, real value in terms of um, getting correct information out quickly, um, especially through the, uh, the early stages of uh, cost planning and, and projects. Um, I suppose it's just worth explaining the, uh, the view that you can see on the screen there is the, the ground floor view, the, uh, the yellow vertical shafts of the uh, lift shafts um, going up, and you've also got the lecture theatres, which are the double height spaces. Um, and again, from a from a, a cost perspective, it does make you um, think of things more in a, a three dimensional perspective when you're uh, planning and uh, plotting where the spaces should sit and uh, how they should all fit in and interlink. And um, I suppose it's, it's it's worth being honest that the efficiencies on this building are not going to like what I'd normally um, put in because they're the efficiencies that you can create with the spaces that uh, we've defined. And that's something that um, at feasibility stage I'd normally go for quite a tight net to gross ratio. And I think um, it's kind of shown that uh, perhaps it needs to be a little bit more caution if you're trying to uh, plot um, efficiency ratios against um, defined uh, room sizes because there's obviously a, uh, an optimum uh, that can be achieved. Um, but more than likely when you've got adjacency requirements it's going to fall slightly. Um, so the um, the cost and right, the model were, were a real help, and then uh, part of it really comes on to the reporting. I think the, the shot we got there is just uh, is uh, a standard report that um, that Becca been producing for uh, the cost information um, and uh, breaks it down into the uh, substructure shells, etc. With the the breakdown of cost, um, we found the standard report's fine. Um, there's lots of um, ability to uh, update and change. The purpose of what we were doing is no real need. Um, but behind it, there was also the, uh, the ability to have the design criteria or, or, or sort of base assumptions, which um, again tends to be something that uh, we we do after the matter. But this allows you to actually pull that out as you're uh, progressing. Uh, for the scheme that we did, this is the, the kind of uh, summary estimate, which is a standard um, kind of breakdown um, to a level of cost, broken uh, into a cost per square meter, as well as a gross uh, construction cost. and um, Whilst I wouldn't want anyone to sort of lift this and uh, tell me how much it cost to build things, it did. Uh, it, it kind of fitted in from a high level where we um, 
we sort of saw things uh, sitting on the scheme. Uh, worth just confirming there's um, already is some existing substructure. So the uh, 50 pounder per square meter for the substructure is uh, low for a reason. Um, but uh, yeah, the adaptability of the reports was fine. And uh, you can always export it should you choose into an Excel form, which then allows you to have a bit more manipulability within uh, packages that perhaps people are a bit more uh, more content with. So that, that was the kind of um, paper trail, but the, the contextual side of the um, cost report was the real bit that, uh, that grabbed our um, client um, because it's added something that um, they've not really seen before from a uh, from a cost perspective. And uh, whilst we're not looking to do um, the architects out of the role planning and feasibility, it does allow us to um, visualize and um, add to the context of the cost that um, generally it's a little bit difficult uh, without uh, detailed discussion or very bad uh, bad QS drawings. Um, so it allowed us to show it on plan, the kind of building and the size, the mass that we were sort of looking at costing against. Um, also allowed us to sort of plot against um, other buildings that have been uploaded uh, to Google Earth, um, which again adds a little bit more context. And this is an area I think that um, this we've seen is um, becoming more and more um, frequent when uh, buildings are developed, that uh, somebody will drop the, uh, the model onto, um, onto Google or for similar. And so hopefully we'll start to see these virtual uh, cities being produced. And uh, again, it adds a little bit more uh, context to how the building will sit and be perceived from the uh, sort of wider campus, wider city constraints. Um, that's kind of the end of the kind of detailed slides um, that we've got. But what I wanted to do was um, kind of wrap up um, an overview of it with um, some specific comments on um, the kind of cost, the visualization, and then generally. Uh, we found the the way it sets up was was very, very easy to, to do. Um, I think it, it is similar um, modeling-wise to a Google Earth uh, uh, sort of sketch up type of um, product rather than um, anything more onerous, um, which suits um, dresses down to the ground because um, I think the challenge is that we expect to do a lot more than that. We um, were able to import the room data very efficiently. It uh, pulls some Excel sheets, which is fantastic, love Excel. Um, and we're also able to put associated cost information in there in an efficient and logical manner. There's the longhand way, which I've shown you a few slides on, but there's also uh, sort of quicker ways to drop uh, standard rate information in, um, in effect creating, you know, replicating a rates library from Excel into the uh, profiler. It's a huge benefit there and uh, great alignment to uh, what we do anyway and uh, the way that we store our information. Um, the depth of cost, very easy to uh, deep dive certain elements or to stay at a high level. I think uh, generally on feasibility schemes, cost per square meter, you might make it elementally a bit. And although people try and do very detailed cost planning, it's, it's a bit early really to get into that granularity. It tends to be cost benchmarking applied against a specific scheme rather than uh, true cost planning. So um, that was really good. And I can see it being a key feature of um, high level overviews and having um, a kind of benchmark library information in the background for costs so that you're able to develop very quickly a view of what a standard uh, secondary school might cost or uh, a standard office block might cost using that information creating visualization and so um, once the legwork's done it, it's a very easy tool to be able to update and um, give, um, give the client information thereafter with the context that's important to it. Um, so you're able to import classifications and existing information through Excel, which is a fantastic interface, and it saves a lot of the kind of duplicating information. Um, and then once you've loaded all of that, the visual change was kind of instantly reflected in terms of uh, in terms of the um, model, um, and uh, it's done it linked back into the costs and information. Um, skipping on to the visualization side of it, um, obviously. When you visualize something, you've got a 3D image of it. It uh, allows people to immediately understand what it is you're um, you're showing them. So that was a huge um, huge benefit to uh, gain consensus. Um, ground condition assumptions and transparency were uh, were a key element as well. You can drop in Google Earth um, kind of contours. I think unless you're doing a massive site, it doesn't actually make a lot of difference because at that scale, it's generally it's fairly flat regardless. But um, the fact that you can take site survey information and drop it in 
is a key benefit. Um, it accepts those file types and it can allow you to do true cut and fill exercises. Um, also allows you to um, detail your kind of borehole um, type of soil, different depths, etc. that you're going to find. Which, uh, when you're doing your, your excavation for a basement, for instance, allows you to uh, again visualise exactly what it is you're going through. Um, which again gets a uh, buy-in from different people. Um, I like to think it brought the cost to life somewhat. I think uh, it's touched at a low start, Excel spreadsheets at the very best of times can be quite dull. And um, this was a, a different and uh, it felt like a better way to interact around that, um, that important element. And also made people aware of what the, the basis and the assumptions were. I think um, it's, it's, it's worth thinking about and not underestimating the, um, the issues caused by uh, misunderstanding and um, misappreciation of what it is. And I've seen, um, obviously not from my practice, but I've seen uh, examples where um, buildings have been uh, costed a floor too short, or uh, you know, the height hasn't been quite right, and this hasn't quite worked, or and it's, it's basic errors that uh, don't get picked up because there isn't that um, instant understanding that you get through through modelling. Um, I think the the modelling helps um, bring the cost to life, but also the Bring that kind of QA the sense check to life as well, and you can see if things are drastically different. If you know the building's twice the size it should be or half the size, it it flags them up and makes it uh, very obvious. Um, as, I, as I said before, I think accommodation configuration when you're actually doing it um, and trying to make the whole thing stack up, it does show a lot more inefficiency rather than optimum. That's something that um, I'm going to take on board and. Uh, going forward trying to give a little bit more uh, flex to my architectural friends when uh, they're trying to design a building with feasibility so that um, we can hike up the, um, the net to gross uh, ratios to, um, to give a little bit of space. Um, and final comment, and um, kind of touched on it with some of the previous ones, it's the clear basis of estimate, which um, I said gives, gives that granularity and the clarity that uh, people want, um, and it's instant. Um, just wrapping up um, the kind of overview of what we've gone through, um, generally we, we found it very easy to use and set up. Um, I'd not, um, I was aware of it, I hadn't used it prior to um, uh, probably September, October time, uh, and in the space of probably a couple of weeks we were able to, to model stuff, not on a full-time basis, but you know, a couple of weeks, um, a bit of onboarding, etc. So I, th I think overall what we produce is probably something that could be produced in, in a day or two, um, including in, importing all the costs, etc., which uh, we're very, very uh, impressed with and, uh, as I say, found it very intuitive. Um, importing room data and associated cost information was uh, very efficient, very logical. Um, I didn't have any problems with that, and uh, it was quite nice to see all the rooms come to life um, as they do when you've got the 3D images in front of you. Um, the outputs uh, that we've got have brought the cost to life somewhat. Um, we've actually managed to be, beat the architect to uh, a theoretical uh, feasibility design on this. So um, that's one up for uh, the QS team, and um, I'm sure their design will be a lot more interesting than my box, but um, I think people understand the premise of it and the reasons. Um, we found by doing this with a lot of engagement from the whole design team, um, and I think you know, I can see this being a key feature really, that um, rather than separate disciplines, it does help people to engage around um, a, a common um, understanding of the scheme. And um, I suppose more important than all of that in terms of making our roles more efficient, etc., was the client feedback we had when we uh, when we discussed with them. And one of the reasons we, we chose this uh, scheme and this client is because we're doing a lot of work with them and uh, they, were, they were very impressed. Um, direct quote was that they weren't aware that this type of product existed and uh, more informal discussions with them around what we'd done. They, uh, they thought it was, um, I think, groundbreaking, probably uh, might have it slightly, but they felt it, uh, they hadn't seen it used um, technology for this sort of uh, requirement before, and they were really impressed with uh, the outputs it could produce and the way that um, it could help to improve and um, make more efficient the, the costing process generally. So um, really positive. They're really interested to understand a bit more around um, how it could work going forward and you know the kind of outputs they can get. So uh, that's been a really positive uh, bit of feedback for ourselves and for uh, PPM and uh, the profiler generally. Um, and that I think concludes 
um, presentation that I've got. So I think it's probably back to you, uh, Gerald, in case I've missed anything on that. That's excellent. Uh, Ian, thank you very much for that. Um, you, know, you covered a lot of the bases there. Just from my own perspective, just can give a little bit of a, of the other side of the argument. I felt that you know, it was certainly well received within EC Harris, which was great, but uh, I think, you know, as Ian alluded to there, we did only have, I think it was three, three weeks, three, four weeks altogether, and, and uh, I think we managed to cover quite a lot in that time, and, and that's due in, in no small part to to EC Harris themselves getting to know the software, but also I think you know, there was that simplicity about it to, uh, particularly at that early stage, to create these models and, and uh, you know, to to really understand where the costs are associated and to get that logical budget together um, and to really, really have an idea of where your costs are rather than just sort of, you know, they often say back of the five packets sort of scenario. But I think this sort of brings it to a new level. And for me, critically as well, all of the outputs that you create within the profiler can be used at later points within the uh, within the BIM process. So the model can go out as an IFC and you know the costing information can go out as Excel files to be used further down the line. Um, energy analysis as well. We, we touch on that during the um, during the kind of trial period, um, but you know, that can go out as eQuest data um, and the sequencing information as well can go out as uh, as Excel data as well. So uh, yeah, I think that certainly covers quite a number of bases um, and what I'd just like to do now, we're coming up towards the, uh, the 22 mark um, and I just have a few questions here as well. Um, I have one question from, from DIT and I have to, to welcome all of, of those guys in from, from Bolton Street this morning. Um, so one question is how accurate was the use of Google Earth in lieu of the usual on-site survey, surveying at the end of the day. Um, I was put in by a Cork man. Um, so, I mean, Ian, do you want to maybe comment a little bit on that? Or, I know we didn't touch too much on Google Earth, but from your own experience of what you've seen of the, of the Google Earth system? Yeah, I mean, in terms of that, that was around how, how accurate um, Google Earth is against the kind of on-site conditions, etc. And I think we touched on it slightly that it's great, it gives it a bit of a visual marker, but in terms of um, actual on-site um, um, peaks and troughs, if you like, in the ground conditions, it's, it's not, not the best, and the, the information that it shows is probably out of date anyway by um, a good few years, because the buildings that should be there that aren't, etc. So it, it's a great marker, it gave everybody a bit of a context to it, and I think that's important, and um, it's, a nice, um, it's a nice ability to do that. But um, we're now getting back the ground survey um, results. Um, so we'd look to input those at the next iteration instead. Um, but as an initial kind of steer, I think it's, 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 a, nice, um, it's a nice ability to have. Yeah, I, think, I think for me it's all about, I mean, obviously your own data that you've collected in, in a more kind of detailed manner will be more, more appropriate for it. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I would imagine that Google Earth will have to... Um, We'll have to look at, uh, or sorry, adhere to certain standards and, and to get a, a decent product out there. So, you know, in terms of Google Earth, it is certainly something, as Ian was alluding to there, that uh, is very good to use when you've got pretty much nothing else. But certainly, DWG DXF is the way to go um, on that one. The next question we have from Ravi uh, is: No demonstration is integrated with schedule and progress reporting modules. Just on that one, uh, Ravi, we did actually on this particular case study with, with EC Harris, um, we kind of, we had the three, four weeks, so we really just focused on um, certain elements of it. Uh, so it was more as a QS background for, for Ian to look at the costing side of things. So we didn't really, in this particular case, get into the scheduling sequencing aspect of it. Um, and it's something that I hope that we can explore a little bit more with Ian uh, going forward. But certainly I'd be more than happy to to show to you at a, at a later date maybe some of the sequencing elements of it and, and how it integrates into the program if that's okay. Um, so from Andrew Turner, um, there is a question, will the slides be available for download? Yes, Andrew, the, the slides will be available for download as will the, um, the video as well. So uh, we have, we've all got, um, 
bases covered on that. The video will be available on YouTube uh, in the coming days and, and will be able to be watched again. We've got a few other questions here. Have you used the software method on a non-rectangular building on a level site? Just how wondering how it works on complex projects. Um, I mean, it has been worked on on complex projects. Um, the Dallas Hunt oil project comes to mind, and that one that was done over in America had quite a uh, unusual atrium kind of running through it. Um, you may or may not know the conference center in Dublin, which is a long atrium running up the top on a slant. It's sort of a similar building, so it it has been used on uh, a non-rectangular buildings and more complex sites and as well. It has also been used on the kind of civil engineering aspect of it as well, um, using basic tools for, for creating roads and, and volumes and stuff like that. Um, this appears to be working in isolation with the rest of the team. Is this going against the teams of BIM? Um, I, I don't really agree with that, to be honest. Maybe I'll, I'll bring Ian on this, in on this a little bit uh, later. But, I mean, where this really works is within design Tourette's environments, uh, where each member of the team is able to come on and, and really um, get an idea of, of the building and uh, get an idea of the surroundings of the building and really um, kind of work together to gain the optimum solution of the building. I mean, I suppose during this webinar we've shown a lot of the costing features of it and how we bring in line items and so on, but there are other scenarios within the profiler such as the Site 3D tool and the 4D sequencing tool as well, which you know, make it more of an inclusive product for, for other design team members. So, um, just on that one there, Ian, I'll, I'll read out the question again, maybe. Um, this appears to be working in isolation with the rest of the team. Is this going against the teams of BIM? Do you have any comment on that, or? I think it's, um, I mean, going forward, you can see a lot more integration, especially early on on a project, around who should use what and the basis for it. And you can see easily this being something that um, um, allows a bit of uh, visualization um, with the ability for uh, cost to be agreed, if you like, for you know, sort of benchmark uh, rates, etc. So that you've got the um, architect developing a, an initial model that can then be exported, used elsewhere, etc. But also the, uh, the QS kind of um, working on the cost inside of it. So whilst I've I've approached it from a, it's quite a nice tool for a, a QS to um, get to grips with, it, I think it could easily be a, a full kind of design team um, tool in terms of something that could be, be used to express um, some feasibility options and have all that uh, kind of cost information behind it. I think, um, it, yeah, in, in terms of one-off schemes, perhaps you would say, well, you know, you're not going to be working with people the same way all the time, but I think um, if, if, if there's a rollout a framework or similar, we work with um, similar architects and engineers on a lot of schemes. Um, I can see real benefits on this the kind of program that works to um, be able to sort of hold all the uh, cost information in there, the agreed rates, etc., and then um, allow others to uh, develop uh, permutations of buildings which um, have got agreed costs applied to them. So I think that it's, that there's a good possibility um, to be able to develop something like that if the circumstances were to suit. That's perfect. Um... Okay, so we have one question here from QPAX. So what does the software cost? Is it a per seat license software? We have a number of different options. We've got three options, just to touch on that briefly. We have a concurrent license, we have a single user license, and we have an annual license, and they, they're on a sliding scale. You'd be looking at a concurrent license of £4,000, British pounds. Your single user license is 3000 and your annual license will be 2000 on top of that. Uh, sorry, 2000 for that annual license, with a um, maintenance on top of that, support and maintenance of £800 per year on that. Um, you know, it's an evolving price target and it's something that we will look at um, with each individual companies um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see where we go from there. Um, Andrew has another question. So, what benefits do you see this having over other BIM cost planning and measuring softwares? Um, to be honest, to answer that question, um, it allows for quicker. It, it, it works in the macro BIM environment, so it allows for quicker um, collection of your information, so quicker representation of your building, quicker internal plotting of it, and I think Ian will 
will verify that particularly with the rooms of the corral and the the uh, how you actually lay out your internal spaces and that gives you a bit of a, a bit of a um, a bit of a, an improvement on some of the other costing softwares that are out there that are in a more detailed environment. It's really the way I see it is that uh, you've got your macro environment where you know you you have conceptual with very little information. You want to look at different aspects of the building, and you know without having to go through the detailed process of creating IFC models and the like. So uh, I think for me that that's what it's all about. It it doesn't it doesn't compete for me with some of the more um, detailed software programs that are out there, the likes of uh, Costos and Costex and that because it really is all about conceptual modeling and it works in tandem with the more detailed programs for you to write out of the, the deprofiler software into Costex and Costos and then continue on that process. So uh, yeah. Um, you have anything to add to that Ian or you know from your own experiences that you've seen? No, I think I think you've um I think it's a different product to um, other costing software that's out there. I think uh, I, I'm, I use um, Causeway, um, which allows you to pull in a full Revit model and schedule off everything. Um, cost X is similar. This isn't meant to allow you to pull in a detailed Revit model and schedule everything off. It's meant to allow you to um, create conceptual kind of macro BIM models um, for you to um, use during the kind of early stages of the schemes. And also to uh, work with adjacencies of accommodation, how that can fit together. So I think it's it, it's part of a, a toolkit, I suppose. That uh, going forward, I think more and more practices and um, professionals are going to want at their disposal as they deal with differing uh, requirements at differing stages. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's um, given my exposure to what else is out there. This this seems to. Um, be a, a one-off in terms of tackling that uh, early um, engagement around cost and uh, models. Okay, um, we have another question here. Do you do you use the program in the UAE uh, on any of these programs, uh, Ravi? Yes, it has. As far as I know, it has been used in the UAE. We're not particularly looking after that area. It is Beck Technology, which would be the parent company that produced the software. So they have certainly. Um, I know they made tentative steps. I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly what they've done, but I can certainly put you in contact and, and uh, discuss it a bit further, um, should you wish. So, yeah, that's that's on that one. Um, so it seems to have dried up a little bit. Um, unless anybody has has any other questions or anything else they want to add. Uh, okay, Andrew's come in with it. So it's best used for early stages of RIB plan of work 2013 before moving on for a more detailed model and cost exercise. Um, yeah, I think that, that's a very good description of, of what is to be used. And I mean, uh, I think Ian will, will uh, also agree with this one that you know you can actually put more detailed costing to it, but you have got to, to look at the laborious side of it and, and creating... Um, you know, you, you're creating detailed um, cost estimates and you're really adding on information that it's, it's not really made to handle the deep provider system. Um, and, you know, you've, you've got to draw the line of where the conceptual process ends and the detail, or the, the high level cost estimate ends and, and the more detailed cost estimate takes over and, and uh, you know, you can, you can use that with the likes of cost X and, and cost S and, and all of these. Okay, so Ken has his hand raised. Um, do you want to maybe, if I unmute you, Ken, if you have a microphone or if you want to pop something into the questions? Okay. How do you cost M and E um, from Ken? So maybe to answer that question, M and E has been used. Um, particularly on the pharmaceutical side of things, so um, they do bring in schematics and they do apply certain costs to those schematics. In terms of linear meter runs of pipes and that, we do have in the new version of 2014, we do have what's known as a, a, um, a line feature. And what that allows you to do is it allows you, so one of the other things you can do in the profiler is bring in um, a transparent view of a PDF, so giving you a floor plan of, of something like that. 
um, you can then draw out the actual uh, layout of the piping and line features. So you've got your, your linear meter run of piping. Uh, you know, you can bring also bring in schematic drawings of, of uh, certain systems as well and apply costs to those systems. Um, so the cost of the system itself and the cost of any pipe runs out of the system and so on. Um, how do you include for circulation areas such as corridors? Um, I mean, you can, is, is that in relation to M&E or just in relation to general corridors? I mean, you have in, in your spaces, you can dictate whatever space they are, and just, just corridors. Okay, well, I mean, you, you can really just, you have a room designation tool which allows you to designate, this is a corridor, this is a, um, you know, lecture theater as you worked on there, and, and different classrooms. So, you know, the different classroom, or sorry, the different corridor spaces will have different uh, cost items attached to it. So, it may have a different floor finish, it may have a different wall finish, it might have wall guards, for instance, in a um, in a hospital scenario where you have a linear meter run of hall guards. So you can individually tailor your spaces to that, uh, that particular area. So the third question that Ken has is, is how is structures costed? Can, how is structure costed? Um, so you can actually put in, you can use a structural grid to actually define columns in it. Um, you can also, um, you know, maybe go on a high level for, for structures in terms of, uh, you know, you, you could take um, the the overall area of the external walls, multiply it by uh, a certain cost per square meter to get you your structure. Um, you know, you can kind of put in a lump sum for your structure um, or go by the gross floor area um, on a cost per square meter basis. There'd be some of the areas we'd be looking at on structure, but... Uh, you know, there are a number of different ways to actually, because it's such a simple modeling tool, you can use the features that you have or components within the model to actually derive the quantities and then on a cost per square meter basis and derive your structure on it. The next question that Ken has is, can you import models from other BIM authoring software? You can import DWG's DXF. In the new version of 2014, there have been a number of uh, positive um, developments on that front as well. You can import now Google SketchUp models directly from Google SketchUp. Um, up until now, uh, because they're not really aesthetically pleasing in terms of, of the output of the model, um, you know, what was generally tending to happen was you'd export it out um, as an IFC and bring it into Google SketchUp and maybe put a few kind of textures onto it as well. Now you can import directly from Google SketchUp uh, and that allows you to actually uh, work on it that way. Also, you know, some of the advancements in terms of Revit. We have a direct Revit plugin, which allows you to do an XML exchange of the information that you have in Revit. Geometry that you have in Revit, you can actually bring it out of Revit and bring it into DProfiler and work on it on that way. Similarly, you can export out your geometry that you created within DProfiler and export it out to, um, to Revit as well. Um, there's also a BIM XML exchange which allows you to use some of the other um, some of the other tools, some of the other sorry, 3D authoring tools such as Archicad, Bentley, all of these systems. If you export out as an ISC in Bentley or in Archicad, you can bring it into a BIM XML converter, which can create a BIM XML file, which can be written into the profile. I mean essentially BIM XML is a light version of an IFC. It strips back all of the information you do not need and essentially will give you an overall um, exterior shell of a building to create as a mass and to work on it that way. Um, and so hopefully Ken, that, that answers some of your questions there. I just have another question from Andrew Turner as well. So is there a concern that the design has been undertaken by non-designers to understand the building more? morphology and site-specific design features such as structural and m and How is liability captured? Um, I mean, I suppose that, that goes back a little bit. It, it depends really who you have around the table um, at that early stage, who's willing to engage in the process. And it's really all about, uh, you know, shifting the focus from the more detailed design phase and getting people involved more and more, particularly if I see, you know, if if an M&E guy is, is across the table from me or a structural engineer is across the table from me, 
he can put his his certain um, he can put his points across and, and get that integrated into the into the model um, and and really um, really drive the project from there. So I mean, yes, um, QSs. Ian showed a little bit on the context. I think he alluded to it there that you know they're not trying to take over from the from the architects in terms of visualization stake, but it does give the the architect or sorry the clients a better visualization of what the project is going to look at. I mean, obviously in terms of visualization, as I said before, it's not the most aesthetically pleasing, but you know it gives you a good overview of of, uh, of what you are dealing with and the, the building shapes that you are dealing with. Um, so. I mean, from, from my point of view, I, I think you know certainly if you get people involved at an early stage, more people you get involved, the more uh, obviously the more um, this is actually going to going to work. So, I mean, I still have Ian on board. Do you have anything to add to that, or anything more you want to say on that? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think as soon as I tell people it costs two thousand pound square meters to build something. I've done inherent design work in terms of some basic assumptions behind that number. And I think all that all that this does is pull those to the front slightly in terms of what it is I've assumed within the costs. I think um, it's not design really, it, it's more visualizing assumptions. Um, and I think, yeah, there probably needs to be a bit of a distinction between the two. But uh, going back to my earlier comment, I think I don't view it as purely a QS's uh, toy. I think it's something that um, architectural practices could use to, um, yeah, with standard um, published cost data, um, to to show that uh, various feasibility options and kind of high level cost swings between them and um, energy analysis, life cycle costings, etc. I think the, if all the data sat there cost wise, you're able to use it for all sorts of purposes and. Um, the same way that an architect prints some cost to a building isn't necessarily a, you know, a quantity of air. I think a quantity of air putting some, uh, some detail to uh, their assumptions uh, to make them a designer. But um, I believe under CDM regs we probably are anyway, so uh, maybe we ought to go the whole hog. But um, yeah, but that's my comment. Okay, thanks Ian. Um, I wonder if there's any more comments anyone want to add? or? Anyone has any impressions of the software or want to add anything to it or feel free? No, all good. I think hopefully it's, it's been clear what we've gone through and um, yeah, appreciate the support from um, from PPM and uh, B Profiler to um, go through the process. Yes, excellent. And we, we appreciate your support as well on, on our side, Ian, as well, because uh, you know, it's really all about you know, BIM, BIM is coming, you know, BIM will be here to stay, in particular with the 2016 mandate as well. Um, it will certainly be the case. Can just one quick question there from Ken. Can you import CAD drawings? Yes, Ken, you can import DWG and DXF drawings as well. Um, you know, if you export them out as, as um, PDFs as well, you can bring them in through an image import. But, uh, you know, we really do have that, that side of things covered as well. It comes in, as I say, semi-transparent to allow you to actually build up the um, the floors and you put in the floor slabs as well it's not just the the bottom floor you can put in you can change the reference plane to whatever uh, slab you wish to have a look at and um, putting in then the floor plan of the floor number one or, or whichever one you like um, and then build off of that and really build up the the rooms from there and the internal spaces from there um, so you, you do have the ability to import CAD drawings as well. Okay, well we're coming up towards the eleven o'clock mark I'd set for the for the webinar. So just like again, just to kind of thank Ian for, for his time for, for coming on and, and uh well, DC Harris as well for uh allowing us to, to showcase the product um, and hopefully it has been a benefit to him and um, just for some of the other guys that are on the webinar as well um, obviously I said the, the presentation and the, the video will be out on YouTube so everyone will be able to have a look at it again um, we are always available to um, to answer calls we have a UK sub distributor as well I must give them a mention uh, John Rizal from Consult BIM 
Um, so you can either contact myself directly in, in PPM or, or probably better to on the UK side to contact John and, and he can arrange any demonstrations or any meetings or anything you wish um, to to kind of showcase the product and hopefully we can uh, we can get the the ball rolling on it and, and uh, have a good good sessions on it and, and uh, you know hopefully we see we'll be seeing a few of you guys in the not too distant future so uh, I'm sure John will be contacting you um, in a little while with, with in the marketing material and please please sorry please feel free to uh, you know offer or ask for a demonstration or a meeting I'll be more than happy to showcase it a bit more so uh, yep Andrew has said thanks so thanks Andrew for, for coming on board and all your guys that ask questions and, and for the people who have been on board and also thanks Dean for, for coming on board again and uh, yeah, we'll also have other webinar series as well in the not too distant future. So look out for those as well, and we hope to educate you a bit more on what the profiler can do. So uh, yeah, we're one minute over what we suggested. So in that case, I'm just going to finish off the webinar and thank everybody for coming on board. Thank you.